Greetings, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ryan Bonfilio, and I teach Old Testament at Emory's, at Emory's Candler School of Theology, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We are so delighted that you can join us for this conversation about the newly released volume, Postcolonial Practices of Care, a project of togetherness during COVID-19 and racial violence, which is edited by Dr. Helena Moon and Dr. Emmanuel Larte and published by Pickwick Publications. It's a remarkable volume, timely and powerful, bringing rich theological and pastoral reflection to some of the most pressing questions of this moment. This webinar is brought to you by the Candler Foundry, a new initiative at Emory that is designed to make in-depth theological learning accessible and engaging outside of traditional seminary degree programs. We do that in a number of different ways, including short seminary level courses taught by Candler faculty and open to the public, and an eight month online certificate program that offers specialized training and micro-credentialing in various areas of faith and leadership, including biblical interpretation, peace building and conflict transformation, youth ministry, and trauma-informed care. The Candler Foundry is also the sponsor of TheoEd Talks, an ecumenical speaker series that brings together leading thinkers in the church and the academy to give TED-style talks on the Bible, theology, and spirituality. You can find out more about the Candler Foundry and its various programs using the link that is available in the chat. Today's webinar will proceed as follows. We'll first hear from Dr. Helena Moon, who will offer some opening remarks about the project's origins, goals, and purposes. Then we will turn to three of the volume's contributors, LaRonda Little, Juan J. Herr, and Lori Klein, each of whom will offer five to seven minute reflections on their particular contribution to the volume, its approach, and the questions it seeks to answer. Following them, you'll hear from Dr. Pamela Cooper-White, who will reflect on what she sees as points of connections between the essays and the broader trajectories and themes that emerge in the volume as a whole. We'll conclude with a time for organic dialogue between the panelists, the editors, and you, our audience. This is meant to be unscripted. We simply want to create space for the panelists to talk amongst themselves and to respond to questions and comments from the audience. With this in mind, we want to invite you to submit your questions and comments using the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. These comments and questions will be anonymous, but you'll also have the chance to see what others are saying. And in doing so, you can vote up comments you would like to see our respondents, uh, our panelists respond to first. You can put these comments through at any point during the webinar. One final thing before we get started, I want to take a moment to read Emory University's uh, land acknowledgement statement. Emory University acknowledges the Muscogee Creek people who lived, worked, and produced knowledge on and nurtured the land where Emory's Oxford and Atlanta campuses are now located. In 1821, 15 years before Emory's founding, the Muscogee were forced to relinquish this land. We recognize the sustained oppression and dispossession and involuntary removals of these and other peoples from Georgia and the Southeast. Emory seeks to honor these, the Muscogee Nation and the other indigenous caretakers of this land by humbly seeking knowledge of their histories and committing to respectful stewardship of the land itself. Now, friends, without further ado, let's get started. Our opening comments, as I mentioned before, are from Dr. Helena Moon, who is an educator who teaches part-time at Kennesaw State University. Uh, she's also a community activist and a parent. She's the author of a monograph, Liberalism and Colonial Violence, Charting a New Genealogy of Spiritual Care. She's also editor of a book for high school students called The Power of Our Stories Won't Stop, Truth-Telling as Democratic Civic Practice. Uh, Dr. Moon, we're so grateful for you to be here. The floor is yours. Good morning. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ryan Bonfilio, Dr. Kwak Fulan, and others from the Candler Foundry for providing the space for us to gather and to speak about our work. I also want to thank Dr. Emmanuel Arte. It has been a great honor to co-edit the second book project with you. I am deeply grateful to have had an opportunity to work together on yet another book project. 
Our first book together, Post-Colonial Images of Spiritual Care, Challenges of Care in a Neoliberal Age, showed me the power of spiritual images and its impact on people and their community's sense of value and esteem. I was told that never had there been an inclusion of a humanist chaplain in an anthology until our book, and the humanist community felt it had taken too long. Equally, the Muslim community had felt valued because we had many strong Muslim perspectives in our book. I've been told of the impact of that book as it has provided meaning to students and professors who have been using it to engage in the practice of creating their own images and models of care that best worked for them. That was one of the goals for us for that first book, that our book was not an end in itself. It was a platform or template for others to engage in the practice of creating, imagining, theorizing, and sharing images that work for them. The dynamic and fluid nature of our field in spiritual care demonstrates that our work challenges, changes most comfortably with the times and engages in practices that adapt to the care needs of people and their communities. We are constantly reinventing, adapting, or adding to our work and our theories. The images we create or construct are motivated and driven by our practices, and our practices are, uh, drive the images. It is a methodology that I think that each image is a type of case study for possibly best practices, what needs to be critiqued, et cetera. And the practice of image producing is a type of critical liberative reflection. And this is why in the midst of the pandemic, I realized that we absolutely needed to have a book on the practices of care. I also reflected on one of the criticisms from a scholar about our first book together, about um, the post-colonial images book. That person um, somewhat arrogantly said, quote, I loved how this book brought together some of the leading scholars in our field, but there were others that weren't a part of our field and that, uh, well, should they have even been in the book? I think it would have been, be uh, have been just people from our field, unquote. In my, in my mind, it was the other people who had contributed, who had no knowledge of the ongoing discourses in our field that had made the book more robust and interesting. Even Donnie, uh, Bonnie Miller McLemore in her epilogue stated that some of the best spiritual care she saw in our book came from the librarian who saw her library as a sanctuary and safe space for children who sought comfort, whether from the books or from her. Dr. Larte and I wanted to demonstrate in that first book that in the field of spiritual care, we did not own spiritual care. I think of people in other disciplines who are equally concerned about maintaining strict boundaries in their field. And to me, that is a type of academic xenophobia. Maintaining artificial borders in academia is the work of Enlightenment era. There are myriad ways to practice, experience, and live spiritual care. We in academia or the Society for Pastoral Theology don't have a patent to it. Spiritual care is much more capacious than we have left out, um, let out for it to be. Womanist theologian Dolores Williams, in discussing why fe uh, white feminist theology was just too narrow for black women, provided the image of the super small dress. Have you ever tried to shove your body into a dress that was five sizes too small? In trying to explain why white Christian feminism was not complex enough to advocate on behalf of women of color, womanist theologian Dolores Williams brilliantly described the image of a dress, the dress of the white feminist, she said, is five sizes too small to cover the needs of black women. That dress is pretty, she said, but it just did not fit. Similarly, the image of white Christian pastoral care in academia is too narrow to fit the kaleidoscopic variegations of ways we know and understand spiritual care. The study of religions was modeled from Christian theological assumptions regarding belief and those studying the spiritual practices and care of communities have operated similarly. Christian meanings cloaked as universal understandings just do not fit the multiplicity, diversity, complexity, and richness of what was universally categorized as religions. We have made our practices fit the definitions, categories, and methods that have been defined as to what constitutes spiritual care by Western standards and definitions of pastoral care. Spiritual care is not just about inclusion or of religious pluralism. Our book highlights the important understanding that true liberation 
means agency through sharing our truths and that those truths shape how we understand what is spiritual care and how we can better support the needs of our community. So this volume has stories from academics, chaplains, teachers, a human rights activist who actually received a MacArthur Genius Award for her work a few months ago, and she shares her award-winning work here in our book. Lawyers, moms, children, and academics not in the field of spiritual care. This, we believe, enriches and enhances our field, not dilutes it and makes it less impactful. Dilution is the same language that conservative political scientist Samuel, Samuel Huntington used in his fears of what is happening to America with the mixing of other cultures. It is conservative and harmful. It matters that the two most important themes of the book that run throughout revolve around collective care and community. The epigraph comes from the work of Dr. Emmanuel Arte and Dr. LaRonda Little. They have done some beautiful collaborative work during the pandemic. And one quote I garnered from one of their Zooms is bro Brother Ishmael uh, Tete's words, we are not better than one another, we are better with one another. Meaning we don't have to be in competition about whose spiritual care matters more or whose is considered more authentic especially when one faith tradition has a monopoly in our country. A few months into the pandemic, when I came to Dr. Larte to ask him to co-edit and give shape to this book, he said, we just finished a book, <laughs> I'm so busy. Uh, but I reminded him that our first book was only halfway done and that we needed to showcase the practices of care he was doing during the pandemic. He smiled and agreed. He's a practitioner, scholar, teacher, and constant learner he taught me the absolute importance of practices in our work. So he said, absolutely, okay, let's do this book. So in post-colonial practices of care, we foregrounded the practices of care that defied traditional religious boundaries. Practices that ultimately were about our shared bodily vulnerability and precarity of the unknown. We included stories that value the importance of quotidian life that gave dignity to ordinary rituals and relationships with one another, and how nature becomes a medium in cultivating practices of care. And the idea of Edward Glissant's consent not to be a single being, which Fred Moten beautifully poeticized in his three volume book, Consent Not to Be a Single Being, was central in our book. Relationships are the root of African spiritual practices, as well as in East Asian Neo-Confucian practices, where there has been less focus on belief than on practices. So orthopraxy over orthodoxy. Our post-colonial practices book highlighted the practices of care that brought healing for many during the chaos and uncertainty of the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and racial violence. Relationships, we argued, require ongoing attention to the most ordinary of rituals, objects, and events, as our first co-edited book on post-colonial images showed in their work. The story showed how relationships and conversations are also part of the resources we have to foster self-healing and agency as an important step in the healing trauma from our recent pandemic years. Thank you. Dr. Moon, thank you for sharing with us. I know I enjoy getting to hear a little bit of the behind the scenes story of how the volume came to be, including your conversation with Emmanuel. I'm also glad that he said yes uh, to your great idea. Well, friends, let's now turn to a few of the, uh, the contributors to this volume, the first of which is Dr. LaRonda Little. Little is the Assistant Professor in the Practice of Spirituality and Health at Emory's Candler School of Theology. At Candler, she also serves as the director of the Women Theology and Ministry Program. And on top of all of that, she is the pastor in charge at Ebenezer UMC in Conyers, Georgia. Her research interests include womanist and feminist discourse, Wesleyan theology, Africana religious studies, spirituality, and interreligious and intercultural encounters. Little is the author of the forthcoming monograph, Stitching Fabrics with Fine Threads Towards a Womanist Holistic Soteriology. She has contributed uh, in a number of ways to this volume, including two essays, 
uh, one of which is titled, Will They Know My Name? A Tribute to Brianna Taylor and Rituals of Hope for Inner Peace and Communal Wholeness During the Pandemic. Dr. Little, it's great to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, the title that that Ryan just mentioned, Virtual Practices of Care. Um, so in thinking about that particular chapter, um, about a year ago, I think I contributed that and gathering my thoughts for today's discussion, I find myself in a full circle moment. As I approached the task of writing the chapter, then at the time I was a doctoral candidate with questions concerning salvation and how salvation is obtained. In those quarantine moments, my thoughts were often drawn to ritual and religious practice as a salvific response to the times in which we were living. In a book entitled Ritual Cosmos, The Sanctification of Life in African Religions, Dr. Evans Wesse writes, so often we suppose that real religion is not or should be concerned with mundane matters as human and natural fertility or social harmony, such as most ritual and especially African ritual aims for. Instead, we insist true spirituality concerns personal salvation from the banal structures of everyday life. Life itself, he goes on to say, without fevered mystical intoxications is both transcendental and actual, both sacred and ordinary, end quote. Zuesi's critique of over-spiritualized, individualized religious practices gets to the root and value of ritual that precipitates out of community while also troubling the concept of individualized salvation. I find Zuesi's inclusion of the concept of salvation intriguing. As I endeavor to do my own work in womanist holistic salvation and spiritual health, the persistent question is, for me, what must we do to be saved? As it were, what must we do to be saved during a pandemic? When we are disconnected from our normal ways of being and doing, and when we are not able to be in community, participating in the rituals, that previously provided form, shape, and meaning of life, what now is ritual? And could it be that the rituals we engage and those we create are the salvific response to the issues of life? My question of salvation comes with the belief that salvation is not simply a proclamation of faith or a distant by and by aspiration. Salvation is a present, practical, and communal endeavor. Through this lens, ritual becomes a source for creative transformation where we participate in the moment by moment progression from disintegration and disconnection into wholeness and well being. In the chapter, I offer that the power of ritual is in the subtle folds and movements of the practice itself, with, uh, which oftentimes go unnoticed until the ritual is over and transitions and transformations have taken place. In 2020, somehow we had to find a way for creative transformation as salvation to become virtual. Thus, I put forward three examples of spaces provided for individuals to be in community. A live podcast, a wellness Facebook group, and a platform for spiritual gatherings. In keeping with my commitment to the flexibility of what I term 
the virtual virtuous virtuoso. These three offerings have transformed in order to be in step with where we are presently. In hindsight, it has occurred to me that there is a ritual in creating and recreating ritual itself. This too is salvific. For the very formfulness of ritual as the rhythm of life or finding a new rhythm is sacred as well as ordinary. Ritual is not simply for the sake of tradition or the keeping of a habit, but rather carries with it a moral and ethical obligation intertwined with the hopeful expectation for transformation and change for the good of the community. And it is a work of the spirit. When we take a careful look at our lives, and embrace our innate status as moral and ethical co-creators in community, perhaps we may see that ritual is salvation. Thank you. Dr. Little, thank you for sharing with us. I'm trying to just, I wanna capture some of those phrases you use, particularly the three Vs uh, <laughs> phrase, it was so rich and good. So thank you for sharing with us and thank you for contributing to the volume. Our second contributor that we're gonna hear from uh, today is Dr. Wan Jae Her. Uh, Wan Jae Her is Assistant Professor of Comparative Theology at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. His areas of research include the fields of comparative theology, Buddhist Christian studies, Edith Stein and phenomenology, and contemplative studies. His essay for this volume is titled Violence and the Rupture of Contemplation, a Theological Perspective. Dr. Herr, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bonfiglio. I, I just first uh, also would like to offer heartfelt thanks to everybody at Emory for hosting and making this event possible. I would also just like to say a special thanks to Dr. Helena Moon and Emmanuel Larty uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, wonderful project. Um, so I just wanted to offer a couple of uh, reflections on my piece. Uh, first, like everybody uh, in this project, I was approaching COVID and specifically the, the, the racial violence that uh, arose with it um, as, as a moment exemplifying yet again um, the logic of systemic violence against marginalized groups, a logic that has undergirded our colonialist and imperialist history, as well as the history of environmental destruction and indigenous communities for the profit of capitalist systems. And for, for the essay that I wrote, I, I was reflecting this uh, specifically in relation to uh, traumatic stress um, that is stored in my body. Um, and I wrote the piece to share uh, a little bit about how I have sought to heal from trauma, um, especially through engaging certain contemplative practices. I begin with, um, with a section on Christian contemplative prayer uh, based largely on a stream of Catholic tradition rooted in a monastic community called the Carmelites. The main practice in this tradition of prayer is silent surrender uh, to, from a Christian perspective, to an unlimited, unconditional presence of love a love that comes from God. And as a person uh, engages in this practice over time, several stages unfold where one's former habits of thought, feeling, and behavior begin to break down. Initially, this process, what's called purgation, feels like losing one's sense of self. Uh, one sense of grounding. But through continued practice of the prayer, of 
returning again and again to silent loving surrender to the divine presence christian contemplation leads to a new wholeness and integration that is no longer based on habitual patterns of reaction to things but on a vast free-flowing divine love and compassion where this is useful in the context at least from my own personal uh, experience and perspective, where this is useful in the context of systemic violence and trauma is the freedom it offers, the potential freedom it offers. Um, by doing contemplative prayer, one really begins to uncover a space within oneself that is free from the force of the power of violence and trauma, the power that can continually wound and completely hijack one's sense of agency. And the practice of contemplative prayer allows the practitioner to live from that space of freedom, of being embraced, feeling safe, and a freedom where one begins to feel more and more empowered Another aspect that I think is useful uh, in, in the context of systemic violence and oppression uh, about contemplative prayer is that the process is designed, so to speak, to deconstruct and reform how we perceive ourselves, others, and our relationships with everything. And that is part of what liberation, I think, is all about. Now, I move on from that reflection to uh, what I find limiting or problematic about Christian contemplative prayer. One, it is disembodied, usually. Uh, the body is more or less a secondary kind of after effect of what's happening to the so-called soul. Um, and this reflects, I think, largely the Eurocentric colonial, colonialist legacy that Gary Okihiro uh, and others in the book talk about uh, uh, stemming from enlightenment rationality that divides the body from the mind. Another problem that I have with uh, Christian contemplative prayer as it's practiced in many communities in the West is that there's often almost no intentional effort to think about systemic issues of you know social political inequality and violence and to connect that to the practice of contemplation uh, as christians and as christian communities so uh, my my basic view is that christian frameworks uh in light of the kind of realities that we we confront and live in have to be radically expanded uh, expanded and i think as a Christian, for me, uh, coming from a Christian perspective, I have to take an explicit posture of learning, of being an apprentice to other wisdom traditions to address both the body and social, political, and economic dimensions of, of being a human person. So uh, in the later part of the book, I discuss, in the essay, I discuss um, how I've really learned uh, from the practices and teachings of Buddhist and Taoist traditions, where there is an understanding of the body and mind as radically and exhaustively interdependent, never separable, uh, and whose practices actively use and engage the body throughout the entire spectrum of the uh, meditation or contemplative uh, training process. So, I just want to end by saying that the piece is, is a deeply personal reflection on, on how I have struggled to uh, work with trauma, systemic violence in light of COVID uh, and racist violence, um, and how it's made me, I think, get a clearer sense of the need for spiritual creativity, especially for marginalized groups uh, in such a context. Thank you very much. Dr. Hur, thank you for sharing those comments and for your essay uh, to this volume. It's really fascinating, and I appreciate the honesty and vulnerability in the way in which you share. 
Our next contributor uh, is Lori Klein, who is a rabbi and board certified chaplain who, at the time of writing her piece, served as the director of spiritual care at Stanford Healthcare. In her life and work, she has taught healthcare providers, attorneys, spiritual leaders, both here in the United States and in Canada. Her recent publications include two essays in post-colonial images of spiritual care, the earlier volume that uh, pairs with this present one. Uh, those two essays were called Spiritual Care in the Shadow of Loss and Uprising and Cultural Humility and Reverent Curiosity, Spiritual Care with and Beyond Norms. Her co-written entry for this volume is titled Spiritual Care in the Shadow of Loss and Uprising, A Year in the Life of a Teen. Lori, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Ryan. And I also want to thank our uh, co-editors, uh, Emmanuel Larty and Helena Moon, for inviting me to be part of today. As Ryan mentioned, I'm one of five authors of this chapter. And the year covered by our essay begins in November 2019, when Stanford Hospital opened a new building through the late fall of 2020. So in my presentation today, I want to give you updates on and reflections about the topics or trends covered by our essay. Chaplains um, Anna Nikitina, Sarah Lapenta H, and Samuel Nkansa wrote about transitioning part of their care for outpatients and families to telephone or video due to pandemic related restrictions on entering the buildings. Two years later, all of us continue to use telechaplaincy much more frequently than before the pandemic, both because visits by loved ones are still somewhat restricted to protect everyone, and because we now see telemedicine and telechaplaincy as an integral and permanent part of our work. And I experience that work now as a per diem chaplain at Stanford Healthcare and also at Montage Healthcare. So examples of how we incorporate um, these virtual modes of connecting are family meetings with healthcare staff as a patient approaches the end of their life, conducted partly by video if needed. Family members present on video as we chaplains facilitate prayers, sacraments, or memory sharing shortly before or after a patient dies. If I'm assigned to visit an ICU patient and that patient is alone and intubated, my supervisor at Montage Health expects me to telephone the next of kin listed in the chart and offer support, which many of them gladly accept. And perhaps the biggest change is that virtually all outpatient appointments for patients receiving palliative care at Stanford are now conducted over video rather than in person. So a little more about that. Before the pandemic, no-shows for palliative care outpatient appointments were commonplace. Now they're relatively rare. To me, this is evidence that access has improved for some of our most vulnerable or least well-resourced patients. And we can, um, count the rise of telemedicine and telechaplaincy for these patients is actually a positive outcome of the pandemic. Chaplain Kfuni Mwamba wrote about the abrupt pivot he made after our spiritual care volunteers were asked not to come to the hospital from March 2020 until just a couple of months ago. He wrote about collaborating with staff and volunteers to arrange virtual visits in which volunteers telephoned interested hospital patients or bereaved family members. As of a few months ago, 30 volunteers completed more than 3,000 virtual visits, including 17 video visits for patients who are lonely or dying. And even though we're now restarting in-person visits by volunteers, the video visits for dying patients will continue, which will increase our ability to support those patients, especially at night. Chaplain Sarah Lapenta H wrote of providing one-on-one -on -one bereavement support to families. As the intensity of their need and the lack of community resources became more apparent, in 2020, Chaplain Lapenta H and colleagues established online 
grief groups for bereaved family members that she has been co-leading with a social worker. Since then, five groups of participants have appreciated connecting, not only with the leaders, but also with each other. Since some of their grief experiences, such as not being able to visit their dying loved one in their last days, or tiny live stream funerals left them even lonelier than usual. My co-authors and I spoke about how we maintained our own resilience and that of our coworkers. As Helena Moon and Loretta Ross noted in their critique of the quote, wounded healer metaphor, quote, we have not fully understood the importance of the practice of self-care and the healing of our own wounds before we can heal the wounds of others and those of society, end quote. As the pandemic continued to stress and distress all of us, we expanded our staff support work to include more frequent rounding on units to check in on frontline staff and unit managers, hosting what we call care for the soul hours to encourage units, unit staff to pause, breathe, and debrief their bedside experiences. And beginning the, just this year, grief support groups specially designed by Chaplain Sarah Lapenta H for Stanford healthcare staff with nine groups so far. A few months after the period covered by our article, our spiritual care team devised a ceremony to mark one year since the COVID-19 pandemic began. In that ceremony, we acknowledge the existence of multiple pandemics arising from white supremacy and structural racism. In an act of calling in, as Moon and Ross described, we lifted up the need to make systemic changes in the name of health equity and restorative justice. This was the kind of hybrid in-person and virtual ritual that I believe embrace the ethic of care and connectedness described by LaRonda Welch Little in her book chapter. For all of us on this webinar, may we have and embrace the opportunity to realize the decolonial visions presented in post-colonial practices of care. Thank you. Lori, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I marvel at what it would be like to co-author with five others in such a team fashion. That alone, I think, is a testament to your creativity and sort of what you model in terms of the collective communal reflection. Um, so I love just the very nature of how your essay uh, came into form. Thank you, Ryan. Our next panelist is Dr. Pamela Cooper White. Um, she serves as professor of psychology and religion at Union Theological Seminary in New York. There, and for the past three years, she has also served as dean and vice president for academic affairs. And she also serves as assisting priest at the Episcopal Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. As a side note, I, I just am, I also marvel at how much all of you do in your various roles and capacities, including you, Dr. Cooper White. Uh, she has published 10 books, including most recently, The Psychology of Christian Nationalism with Fortress Press in 2022. She also serves in all of her spare time as president of the International Association for Spiritual Care in Switzerland. And she's on the board, the editorial board, excuse me, of the Journal of Pastoral Theology. Dr. Cooper White has written the epilogue for this volume, which is titled Reflections on Irony and Eschatological Hope. Dr. Cooper White, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for this invitation. And also, um, of course, again, thanks so much to Helena and to Emmanuel um, for this beautiful work. And um, it pushes the envelope even further on what is academic writing and scholarship um, to a truly um, post-enlightenment uh, collage. And so I'm very proud to be asked to be the uh, writer of the epilogue and very honored. Uh, my epilogue was entitled Reflections on Irony and Eschatological Hope. And um, I think those are overarching themes uh, in this volume. Irony because although we use the term post-colonial, um, as the Puerto Rican 
theologian Dr. Luis Rivera Pagans has said, um, we are far from being post-colonial. We are still in a very colonial world. And a scatological hope in the sense that um, we hope for what is not yet and yet what is promised, um, the already not yet of what we can embody and what we can live into. And so I wanted to share a few remarks about both of those themes, irony and scatological hope. Uh, escaping subjugation in Britain, the first white settlers on this continent revisited subjugation on Native Americans and enslaved Africans and Caribbean Islanders. The U.S. was founded on blood. So if retaliatory cycles of traumatic reenactment seem inevitable in human nature, if Freud is correct that man is wolf to man, and hatred based on skin color and sexism, misogyny, seem to be as ancient and persistent across the globe as humankind, where is the hope? And what role does pastoral theology have to play in living into this hope? I've just two reflections to add to the wealth of rich writings in this volume where hope and care illuminate every page. First, I think we need to recognize and demonstrate in our living that diversity is a gift rather than a threat, as the Christian nationalists that I've been studying perceive it to be, for example. To embrace diversity is a beautifully wobbly, contingent, but sustaining and creative foundation for all our work as pastoral theologians and practitioners and all our living. Diversity of peoples, of cultures, of religious traditions, when respectfully engaged on their own terms and not as a voyeur or a distanced observer impervious to influence, can invite indigenous and non-Western spiritual wisdom to reanimate moribund Western theological pseudo-certainties. Because what in the realm of faith is ever truly monolithically certain? And this in order to revalue and restore the earth as it is imperiled by the current dominance of hyper-capitalist and masculinist programs of extractivism across the globe, extracting by force the, quote, resources of the earth and exploiting the people on whose backs we live and move and have our consumerist being. Second, as a Christian theologian deeply impressed and formed early in my divinity training by the political theologians of the 20th century, I continue in this ironic present time of still colonialism to embrace a theology of hope for a true post-colonial world in the future. I believe this can only be achieved by truth telling in the present about the collective traumas of our racist sexist past. My hope is not based on a repristination of any mythical, peaceful civilization in the ancient past. As Homi Baba, one of the first post-colonial theorists wrote, we cannot recreate a pre-colonial past, some of which has been idealized through nostalgic remembrance of the good elements and a selective repression of the bad. But we must not reinscribe the imperialist forces that colonized others in the past and the present. Baba's concept of hybridity suggests a moving forward in which there is genuine engagement, honest dialogue about past hurts and fears, and perhaps eventually even an intercultural embrace, as Emmanuel Larte has so eloquently written over two decades. But in which, as Baba insists, each culture must retain its uniqueness, no melting pot, no homogenization. Post-colonialism as a yet unfulfilled eschatological hope cannot be lived into by repressing the horrors of the past as, but by education and cultivation of consciousness of the split off past that wants to remain repressed. Such hope is best achieved, I believe, by holding one another accountable to such consciousness in love and gentleness and I, uh, Loretta Ross is actually one of my current heroes for talking about calling in. 
um, which is far more effective than browbeating born of a defensive need to appear to be non-racist or a need to feel pure in oneself. And by being intentional about stretching our relational overtures to the quote foreigner and the stranger, the one who is strange or other to us. And then listening, listening much more than we speak. speak based on my own theorizing that even individual human persons are multiple, not monolithic. I also remain convinced that the first step toward listening to the foreigner or the other is to listen deeply to the multiple voices of the foreigner or the other within ourselves, quoting Julia Kristeva. Whether that's through meditation, therapy, spiritual direction, Whatever form of self-inquiry you may practice, whatever it takes to bring that internal other that we most fear or hate into consciousness. And there are wonderful deep probing theologians who will also help to get us there, many of whom are represented in this book and its predecessor volume, as well as other prophetic voices, some now departed, whose words continue to inspire and incite us, Baldwin, Baba, Cohn, Gutierrez, Fanon, Spivak, it is precisely the otherness that we most fear or hate, which is an outgrowth of fear, those strangers within and without, that may become the wisdom bearers we most need to allow humanity to retreat from our own violence and folly and to save our imperiled planet. Thank you. Dr. Cooper White, thank you for those remarks and for helping us see some of these connections and trajectories of the volume as a whole. Um, friends, this has been remarkable just to listen in uh, on these amazing authors and contributors to this volume. Uh, but we're not done. In fact, I think maybe now the most exciting part comes where we're having a, a sort of an unscripted conversation among the panelists, the editors and you the audience. So if you haven't already, please feel free to continue to put forward comments and questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll be able to collect them and gather them. We will use them uh, for part of the conversation, but also uh, we'll ha have conversation develop among the panelists as well. And to lead the way in this part of the webinar is Dr. Emmanuel Larte, who probably needs no introduction, but I will introduce him nonetheless. Uh, Dr. Larte is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Pastoral Theology and Spiritual Care at Emory's Candler School of Theology. He has taught at numerous places, including Trinity Theological Seminary in Ghana and at the University of Birmingham in the UK. He is the author of six books, including In Living Color, an intercultural approach to pastoral care and counseling. And I should say here at Candler, he is one of our most beloved professors for uh, many, many reasons. Uh, so Emmanuel, I will turn it to you. Uh, we are so grateful for you and for your sharing your wisdom with us today and in this book. Thank you very much, Ryan, and thanks to all participants on this webinar, uh, and thanks for all the contributors to uh, the book Postcolonial Practices um, of, of Care. The leading theme that galvanizes what we were, were, were doing uh, is captured in Gary Okihiro's uh, uh, intro introduction where he speaks about uh, third world studies uh, and you could replace that by post-colonial uh, studies. Uh, he describes them as a conversation about liberation from the powers that oppress and exploit. And I, and, and I think that the sense of conversation, the image of conversation, Writing is a can be a form of con conversation, but beyond that, the very art of engaging in conversation, which is often the the, the, the typical means by which care is offered and received, uh, is 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 truly uh, a powerful way of understanding what we do 
in caring for one another. And so I want uh, to really invite us into conversation with one another. Uh, and there, there are a couple of questions that uh, are in the, uh, in the Q&A. And I do invite uh, others to include questions there. But there are questions. Uh, there's a question uh, there that I think each one of our uh, contributors can perhaps make responses to. And the question is this, what are some of the ways that chaplains and spiritual health professionals develop their clinical skills to best adapt to a post-colonial informed practice of care provided in the local environment. So this question about what are, what are the, the practices in a sense that uh, spiritual health professionals use to develop their clinical skills within uh, the, the, the context of their particular localities. And I really want to invite every one of uh, our, our, our panelists to offer some, some thoughts about, about this question. Uh, so, um, Laurie, would you, would you uh, like to go first, please? Uh, sure. So, I will answer a little more specifically, but in, in a broad way, in the first volume in this series, Post-Colonial Images of Spiritual Care, um, I addressed that, that question in yeah. uh, my essay. So you can look at that. But um, kind of more generally, you know, there's about what you do in practice, and then there's what you do in terms of um, education. So in your practice, I mean, fundamentally, what we are doing as spiritual um, health professionals is we're listening. And right. so really to try to, you know, listen and do that kind of the, the kind of thing you probably did in verbatims when you think afterward and try to listen in a way so you're stepping past your assumptions about what family structure should be like, how people relate to the sacred, how people relate to end of life, how people express or don't express their grief um, or how they express their grief in different ways. So to develop that sensitivity in your listening and then in terms of your education, I encourage you to find ways to take in content where people from different cultures are speaking in their own voices as opposed to, you know, there are some handbooks out there. Um, whenever I look at one of these handbooks about how you take care of everybody, I always look at the Jewish part first. They almost always get 75% of it wrong and it's clearly done through a Christian lens. Right. So I don't think handbooks are very helpful. But these days there are webinars and books about how people relate, for example, to the healthcare system or historically have. Um, in people's own vo voices that I think can be helpful in just sort of broadening then how you then listen. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Little, Laronda, with you. Um, thank you, Lori. Um, you, you took the words, some of the words right out of my mouth, um, but I would add to um, your thoughts on listening, um, that listening gives rise to space. Um, as we, we, less, we listen um, to the person in front of us, that also um, opens the way for providing space for the other. Um, that is the other um, part to, to that. In our practice, we you know, as we give space to the other, we give space to ourselves. I think oftentimes as we enter into these um, caregiving professions, we go with a particular intention. Um, and we also have um, this notion that perhaps we have to do or say 
And I'm also thinking about uh, what Juan Jay shared with us regarding contemplation and, and contemplation as a source for, for healing and, and developing a healing praxis is what I heard. Um, so along with the listening, holy listening is the creation of space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong Jay, would you like to um, expand on that? I, I uh, Yeah, I invite you to do that if you like. No, I, I, I thank you uh, very much. And thank you, um, Lori and Loranda, uh, for your wisdom. I, I don't have much to add. I think just for specifically Christian uh, spiritual care practitioners, I, I think speaking as a comparativist, I think it's mm -hmm. important for us to really be critically self-aware of not imposing our theological frameworks on the worldviews of those uh, you know, we're caring for. Uh, that's a liability for you know Christians. It's kind of heightened because we live in a society and culture where it's Christian centric. Um, so I think in our education process as caregivers, uh, that component of self-critical awareness and comparative learning, I think, uh, is important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pam. Pam. Yeah, um, I'm really grateful to be to have been at Union Theological Seminary these eight years because we have a very robust program and a, and a concentration in interreligious engagement. And I've learned a lot from that program, um, in particular, and, and this echoes what uh, some of my co-panelists have said already, it's really important to engage with people um, about their religious or spiritual practices and tradition on their own terms, not our terms. And, um, you know, as opposed to a comparative religions approach or even a comparative theology approach, we still um, see Christian supremacy all over those disciplines. And so um, we even have gone so far um, among our scholars to talk about multiple religious belonging, um, John Tatumanol and, and also um, Dwayne Bidwell, on the West Coast, uh, we that handbook is useless because we can't assume that a person, they may be nominally, say, Muslim, but maybe they are also now attending a Lutheran church in the United States and that community, and maybe they're also practicing other forms of spirituality in their private practices. And um, many of us uh, would identify with more than one spiritual base not as a not as a means of appropriation of someone else's culture, but but genuine engagement um, across boundaries, I think, is part of also our interrupting the colonial and enlightenment mindset about what religion is at all. And right. um, so we have to approach another person with great humility, even understanding that how they first introduce themselves spiritually may not be the whole story. Yes, uh, thank, thank, thank you so much. That uh, that is particularly one of the impulses uh, for for this particular text. That the the the, the very um, fact that uh, in in practice uh, we tend to be transgressive of the boundaries that uh, within which I mean I I find that I. I am deeply transgressive of the boundaries in which I was kind of shaped and formed uh, as a Protestant um, Christian pastoral caregiver. You know, the, I mean, the, the fact that um, I have found such um, help and such value in meditative practices um, from that are developed particularly out of other religious traditions, um, like, like the Buddhist traditions that uh, uh, Dr. Wanjay was you know, referring to. I mean, that, 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 um, that, that is something that um, is tremendously valuable uh, and, and, and 
uh, reflects in, in the way in which I am uh, offering care to others, uh, particularly um, freeing people from the guilt that is associated with these transgressive moves, uh, which, which often our traditions place upon us for doing these very things. You know, as an African, uh, there are many African um, practices and, and rituals and so on that I was debarred from participating in as Christian, right? Um, and there's still a lingering guilt feeling um, when I engage in these kinds of rites, like libation, which is um, a rite of prayer, a rite of connectivity, and so on. But it's, it was completely, uh, and it still is completely denigrated and, and considered to be outside the pale, right? Um, and yet it is, it is, it is a, a means of communication, a means of uh, community building, a means of communication that transcends the, 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 the physical world and enters into the ancestral uh, connection. So, so this, 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 this permission is one of the things that uh, was really important for me in terms of this text. Because we all know that texts often are the things that if one can say that, oh, well, this particular text allows me to do this, um, then you know that's often um, legitimizing uh, things that we would do otherwise, you know. So um, yeah, that's for me very, very important. Those transgressive uh, kinds of of things that we permit ourselves to enter into, because we recognize that the boundaries that have been uh, put around what is religion, what is care, what is all of these things, they are not necessarily inherent in the actual thing that we are trying to trying to do. Um, yes, so, so there is, a, there, there is a, another question, um, which I think actually does develop on what we've just been talking about. And this is the question, what do you think will be the best roles, development and growth for spiritual health professionals in the world of global health initiatives i think that this this uh, this particular question is is playing on this role and and then kind of participation in in the, in the global discourse i think it's playing on very much on uh, what is our local as well as our global connectivity um does anyone want to, does, does this question call to you, any one of our panelists? I don't want to call upon anyone uh, uh, before, uh, in case there's somebody who feels uh, you'd like to answer at this point. Yes, Laurie, please. Yeah, I have one thought, which is our role on healthcare teams is often to bring the voice of the individual and you know the more the holistic voice and the ways in which our practices impact um, individuals and families. And so this is just a wondering. Um, but I, you know, I wonder if if being able to bring in that kind of voice so that because um, one of the things that sometimes happens with big initiatives is there are all kinds of unintended consequences or maybe, right. you know, I, consequences that just proceed because of structural inequities. So we can be, I think, the, maybe some of the, the storytellers that can help modify that. Right, right. That, yeah, thank you. That's, that's... Um... You know this 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 thing about role uh, for me is is um, is one is is also one of those things that uh, I, I feel needs to constantly be interrogated. You know, what is my role? 
um, recently, uh, as some may know, um, uh, my church uh, appointed me to be bishop, you know, and I, I still consider to, I, well, I won't say, I'll say no more about that. But what is this role? What, what you know, what, what does it actually do in terms of my participation in the, the caring functions of uh, human beings uh, and uh, within the global context, but also within the particular local context in which um, we live. I think that the, it, it, it's very much important for us to interrogate and in, sense, in a sense to problematize this role thing, these role and these titles and these images that go with these. Uh, because I think that in, in, in some ways, uh, and this is a challenge that all, uh, I, I know that certainly people entering into like uh, contextual education or immersive experiences and so on, often have to, you know, ask themselves, am I going to put on the badge that says chaplain, or am I going to really go in and encounter people as they uh, really are without that? I think these are some of the, these are some of the in interrogative things that I think are important in performing the care role. Um. Yes, sir. I I was I was kind of stuck on the question and was and was thinking about why am I stuck on this question, um, and it is and it does have to do with with the roles that we play because even in, as a pastor and I'm thinking about my role as a pastor, and how do I participate in the global um, health project, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and one of the ways is in, in my interrogation of my role as pastor is um, thinking about spiritual, the intersection of spirituality and health, which is um, what I've been thinking about these days, and intercultural um, relations. So I pastor a congregation that is predominantly white in a very diverse community. And so my role mm -hmm. um, is a pastor, but it's it's complicated right. because of those dynamics. And as I continue to think about spirituality and health, how then do we define the this subject um, of spirituality and health, because I see them as one, as interrelated and intertwined within this particular um, congregation, within this particular context. So it's an intriguing question that that I will, yeah, continue to to think through. Right, Pam, Pam, Pam thank you, Pam. Yes, and I, I think you you you've worn so many hats, uh, and so on, so. I'd really, really yeah. like to hear your reflections on that. Well, actually, I, I want to um, do a shout out to Helena Moon. Um, I think the first thing I ever wrote, uh, read from you, Helena, was the um, article that you wrote on female genital cutting or female genital mutilation and the, the, com the complexities of understanding that and what it means to different communities. Um, the harm that it can involve medically, but also what are some of the indigenous practices that are important to communities and how do you weigh those things? And, and I just wanna highlight that as spiritual caregivers, we also are often called upon to talk about ethical decision-making. What are the ethics of a situation? And um, we can't go bowling into other cultures and other continents from the West, assuming that we are the white savior or the Western savior. Um, and yet there are complexities that we do have some, some knowledge to offer. And uh, for example, you know, when, when communities in some parts of Southern Africa were talking about to cure AIDS, all you had to do was sleep with a virgin, which meant find yourself a 13 or 14 year old girl maybe. 
um, we might consider that pretty reprehensible. And how do you then navigate misinformation that's coming from an indigenous culture without being disrespectful and yet knowing certain things that can be harmful? And by the same token, Western medicine isn't harmless either, nor is it non-discriminatory as we know. Um, and so how do we approach these questions in a dialogical way with humility? How do we know what we can bring, but then also how we can have a give and take and listen as much as we speak, uh, especially when we're moving into these very complex ethical questions? Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, uh, Dr. Moon, Helena, did you did you uh, want to? I, I think you might want to say something. Please do in 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 this conversation. That would be great. Yes. Helena, I you're think muted. you're muted. Yeah, I think you'll have to admit. Okay, yeah. Sorry, thank you. And I did speak up. I was part of the Institutional Review Board when I worked at the University of Chicago Hospital as a staff chaplain. And right. these the very concerns that the um, IRB me members would be discussing. And it was coming from this very paternalist lens of, oh, well, you know, Western medicine, et cetera. And so I did speak up on various um, protocols that they were trying to get passed that um, to you know, be involved in a listening capacity and to understand that the culture and the communities that um, they would have to be the ones to make these decisions and not um, having this kind of cloak of superiority. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Cooper White, for bringing up what you did. And so I, I did want to add another um, comment of um, an interesting book that. I'm starting to read by, um, I believe his first name is William Hawking, and it's called Rethinking Missions. And there was a book written in the early um, 1900s um, about missionary work. He's a professor at Harvard. And he um, said, you know, this missionary thing, we've been doing it, but I feel that it's wrong. <laughs> and that uh, he brought up with other people, and it was called the Hawking Report. It's known as the Hawking Report, that um, evangelizing and trying to change other people's cultures, they felt after doing it and living in the country and meeting people, becoming friends with others, that they didn't uh, feel the need to evangelize and that we should rethink what Christian, the role of Christianity should be in the global world. And so it was called the boomerang effect that they ended up learning more about other people's cultures and how wonderful it was to be engaging in this reciprocity. Um, and yet, uh, you know, this mindset of Western superior superiority continues, but a lot of the early evangelical uh, children felt the same way that they were revising what their parents' role was to be evangelists in other countries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. We are right at the uh, the cusp or the uh, of our time. Um, th there is one question and uh, which I will I will pose and um, I really want to invite uh, 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 one day if you have just a word or two in response to this uh, question, then that will be uh, all that we'll have time for. The question is, how can members providing spiritual care in the military provide a prophetic voice in light of po past colonializing practices and the potential for future ones as well? There are the issues of moral injury and spiritual distress amid potentially traumatic situations. One yeah. day. Thank you. I'll just say very briefly, thank you for the question. I, I, I mean, I don't have an expertise in this, but I, I think uh, one thing that comes to mind is bringing stories of those who have suffered from such practices into dialogue uh, in the military community is one thing that, that uh, can begin a process of uh, re-envisioning and transformation. 
Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And I will also refer the uh, questioner to Dr. Zachary Moon, who is um, a military chaplain. He's actually a professor at Chicago Theological Seminary, who is, um, his, his tradition is Quakerism. So he's, uh, and he's a military chaplain. So I think he might have some further insights that might be helpful um, for the particular questioner. Friends, I, I want to thank you very, very sincerely and uh, hand it back to Ryan at this point. Dr. Larte, thank you. And thank you to all of you for engaging in such a conversation. Um, it is, I'll just say as a, a host to this webinar, it's just a privilege to listen in on your conversations. I'd be happy to do that any day if you all are gathered again. Um, we are at time and we are grateful again for all of our panelists, for Dr. Moon, Dr. Larte, and what you've done in bringing together this volume. For those of you in the audience, we're so glad that you've spent your uh, this hour and 15 minutes with us, whether it's your lunchtime or some other time, depending where you are, we're grateful for that. We know a lot is already on our schedules and plates. And we hope this conversation, if you've already read the book, uh, has deepened your appreciation for uh, the topics and practices discussed. And if you haven't yet read the book, we hope this conversation further whets your appetite. And while we get no financial kick kickback, uh, we hope you actually go online or some other place and actually buy the book. It's a wonderful uh, volume, as you can tell from this conversation. Everyone, thank you again uh, for attending this webinar. You'll be able to see uh, a uh, the, the recording of this session will be available on the Candler Foundry website, which is candlerfoundry.emory.edu under resources. So you can look for that if you want to watch uh, the recap, or if you want to share it with a friend. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, be well, everyone. Stay safe. And uh, thank you again for attending. Take care.